Live from San Francisco, it's theCUBE. Covering Informatica World 2017. Brought to you by Informatica. Okay, welcome back everyone. We're here live in San Francisco for theCUBE's exclusive coverage of Informatica World 2017. I'm John Furrier with SiliconANGLE Media. My co-host, Peter Burris, head of research at SiliconANGLE Media, as well as the general manager of Wikibon.com, Wikibon Research. Check it out, uh, some great research there on IoT, big data, and certainly uh, cloud computing. Our next guest is Graham Thompson, Executive Vice President and Chief Information Officer for Informatica. Great to see you, welcome back to theCUBE. Good to see you, John. Um, conference here, a lot of customers, the Executive yeah. Summit, uh, dinner last night. Um, you're kind of like the sounding board. They go to you for like the, the checkpoint. Hey, is this a story jive? What's going on internally? Because you're living through a transformation as yeah. well at Informatica. Your customers are going through a transformation as well. We're at this tipping point. What's your take so far at the conference and is that still the case and anything, anything you'd like to share on that would be great. Yeah, yeah I mean we're, we're proud to have some of the world's best companies using our products to do meaningful and important things. Uh, and the scale that some of these companies are are doing it at is just staggering. I, I met with someone last night at dinner and uh, at Allegis, a talent management organization, and they process and keep up to date 55 million resumes every day. And they extract the metadata from those resumes to match the right candidate to the right, the right job. And the, you know, that's interesting for them as a company, but the societal impact of that's significant. You're matching, I mean, we're all starved for talent and you're matching the right talent with the right opportunity more often than not. Using the intelligence of the data, it's, uh, it's pretty interesting. And then of course, I know you had uh, Andrew McIntyre from the Cubs on yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how can you not love that story <laughs> of how uh, an organization as great and renowned as the, as the Cubs is using data to transform its business operations. It's, it's really amazing. We had Bruce Chisholm on, who's the uh, executive chairman of the board yeah. of Informatica, was on the board at Oracle. But Peter asked him an interesting question that I'll ask you is, yeah. what do you, what's your definition of strategic data management? That's a good one. So, the way, the way I define it is, if the basis of your competition is on digital assets compared to physical assets, so we're no longer dealing with plant and machinery or even capital, it's digital assets. If that is the basis of your competition, then the data that you rely on is, a, is the very foundation of that. And then it becomes strategic, just like money is strategic and the access to talent is strategic. The ability to leverage the data within your company, about your company, is strategic and you have to be able to do it on-prem, you have to be able to do it in the cloud, and you have to be able to do it in the real world where most of us live, which is in both worlds. Uh, and that, to me, that's what makes it strategic. But let me build on that, Graham, because in many respects, the, uh, the whole concept of digital transformation is, uh, or well, let me step back, one of the premises of business is to try to reduce what's known in financial or economic worlds as an asset specificity. So, Traditionally, we've looked at assets and said, this asset's going to be applied to that use, and this asset's going to be applied to that use. And if it's not, if the use isn't needed, or if it's not being applied, you lose the value of the asset. One of the basic premises of digital business, and business generally, is how do we reduce asset specificity, and data lets us do that. Yeah. By turning an aircraft engine into a service, we have mm -hmm. transformed the role that that asset plays in our customer's business. So it's, it's, you're absolutely right, it's the ratio of physical to digital assets, but all businesses have to find ways to reduce their asset specificity by adding digital on top of it so they can appropriate that asset to a lot of new purposes. Do you agree with that? Uh, absolutely. So take, um, uh, so I know you talked to Sally about the data lake. So take a, a use case like uh, customer support. Who, who in a software company knows more about the customer, what product they're running, what version of product they're running, what they're using it for because of the connectors they have? Nobody in the company knows more about that than the customer support organization. But that asset, the most profitable use of that information might be in marketing, because then we can help our customers adopt something more quickly, we can help them get value from it more quickly, and it helps us because it helps us focus our R&D effort where the customers are really uh, using the product instead of having a guess. So I think you're, you're spot on. If you can remove the, the constraint on the asset to be for who paid for it, for one particular purpose and make it available to the entire enterprise and outside the enterprise, then you really start to see the, the value. The thing that you mentioned about digital assets, Peter and, and the Wikibon team talk about this all the time in their research, digital assets is the data. 
yeah. not whether it's content or whatever, certainly we're in the content business. Well, digital assets are data. Are, are data, exactly. And, and whether it's content or whatever aspect it is. So I got to ask Software. you. I gotta ask Software. Software is a digital asset. Software. It's data. Yep. Data is at the center of it all. So I got to ask you, there's been a lot of artificial intelligence washing going on in the industry. Yeah. I call it augmented intelligence because it's truly not yet artificial by the strictest, purest definition. Uh, but machine learning is very relevant. We talked about IoT when you were last in our studio. Um, how is it impacting your business and, and customers' business? Because that's the real proof in, in the pudding, if you will. Um, and customers are trying to sift through the BS that they're hearing from other folks. I'm not saying yeah. that you guys are saying BS, but what's the acid test? What's the, what's the, how do you differentiate between smoke screen and real deal? Yeah, so I think it comes down to, like any other technology investment, is what is the business outcome that it generated? So if you're trying to, so humans make mistakes. So if you're trying to eliminate human error from a process, a machine can execute that process more repeatably and uh, more accurately than a, than a human. It's not about reducing cost, that's only semi-interesting. It's about enabling outcomes that weren't possible before. So you think about uh, healthcare industry. You know, we, everyone talks about self-driving cars and how mm -hmm. safer it will be if the cars uh, aren't dependent on a human. But one thing I, uh, uh, I read recently is we kill more people in the US by prescribing the wrong drug or the wrong dosage than we do on the roads. So human, humans, are they work hard, but they make mistakes. If we can have the machine do that job, because a human can tell it how to do the job, um, and it can learn over time, then you eliminate that, that error, and we're able to do things that we can only, only imagine. Yeah, uh, machines right rarely get tired, they rarely lose attention, blah, 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 yeah. and it's all those things we'd like to, we'd like to, and that's where the augmentation is, is because uh, and, and there will be there will be other forms of artificial intelligence. The algorithms have been around for a long time. Yeah. The hardware now can support it, and the data is being generated to apply it. Yeah, the data is available, and com the cost of compute is approaching zero. So we're able to yeah. do things that we the government could only do before. Graham, I want to get your thoughts on data integration. Um, yeah. and certainly, we saw yesterday the news with Google Spanner. You guys were one of three companies that was early on before they announced, they announced their general release of Spanner worldwide, uh, the distributed database, horizontally scalable yeah. database, big deal. But you guys were also on the front end of that, as it says in, the, in their blog post, mm -hmm. um, and you guys are really strong at data integration. What are some of the challenges um, that the customers mm -hmm. face with in integration? What are the key things? Because that yeah. seems to be, whether you go in multi-cloud or hybrid cloud today, which is a gateway to multi-cloud, which is happening pretty fast, um, data integration is pretty important. Yeah, so as a CIO, this is something that is uh, a very hot topic for me. And it's not a new hot topic, it was a hot topic 15 years ago when we went nuts and deployed all these client server applications because they were cheap and easy. And then you had to think about, oh, th these different disconnected applications don't serve an end-to-end -end process anymore. Now I have to stitch them all together. That was hard, but it was all on-prem and you had access to it all, so it wasn't that hard. It was all programmed. Hard. Right, whereas now, like you said, the, you've got Salesforce, you've got Workday, you've got great people, you've got your on-prem stuff, you've got applications that you're hosting on someone's PaaS cloud and the IAS cloud and the SaaS cloud. But to execute an end-to-end -end business process to generate an outcome, you have to tie it all together. So instead of thinking about- And it's about not on-prem, so you can't touch it and you have to, it's not on, <laughs> you don't have that. Right, so you can't, uh, you can't hand code that. You could, but it would, I would argue that that would be a, an unintelligent way to do it which is where microservices APIs come in, so you can leverage the R&D efforts that the great software vendors like Salesforce create for us, and then you use microservices to plug into that, instead of having a, an army of people hand coding interfaces, yeah. which is what we used to do 15 years ago. Back to your human ago. error point, I mean, it could be spaghetti code, all kinds of errors yeah. could happen. Yeah. But also the maintenance of that is just virtually impossible, given the speed and, uh, and, and the, the, the fact that human beings are now thinking about new ways of doing things. Yeah. You just can't keep up with that. Exactly. I mean, I mean the, the, the coding thing's a big deal. We used to call it back in the day, spaghetti code. Yeah. Because it's like all this integrated, purpose-built coding for one purpose to glue it together. Right, and then you change one data element, you have to rewrite and retest well, the, the guy whole leaves or the girl leaves. It's, like, yeah. it's a nightmare, right? With APIs and microservices, you're decoupling that. That's kind of what I think right. you're getting at, right? Exactly, and that's what the whole iPaaS space is about, right? You can decouple the user experience from the, the data and just have what does the user have to do? And then the microservices and APIs will take care of the, the, the work behind the scenes between, um, between the applications. And that really lets, there's this concept of a citizen integrator, 
Yeah. So 15 years ago, it was kind of a modern thought to have <laughs> business people write reports. I think it, w it won't be long before but we'll be able to give the business teams the ability yeah. to do integration between applications without depending on me. I well, was talking with a young developer the other day and I'm like, hey, you know, your coding is like me doing PowerPoints. They're like, what do you mean? I'm like, it's so easy. No, I'm like, oh, it's not that easy. Well, <laughs> but we, we've, been do, we've been building macros, good or bad, inside, for example, things like Excel for a long time. Yeah. And one of the primary drivers, in fact, of a lot of the BI stuff was citizen coders building mm -hmm. macros and said, I need the data to make my little macro run. Now, I don't want to say that that is, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about something that's considerably more robust where we can be very, very creative in thinking about how we might use the data yeah. and then being able to discover it and find it and very quickly and with a low code orientation being able to make the actual application happen that has a consequential impact yeah. in the marketplace. So, so, Graham, you're in a company that is trying to help customers move through some of these transitions. You're in a crucial role because we know where the data is, we know how to integrate it. We well, do. We're discovering where yeah. the data is, we have tools that's going to help us, we're learning how to integrate it. But one of the big challenges is to get the business to adopt new orientations to the role yeah. that data is going to play. That to me is one of the key roles of the CIO. Having worked with a lot of CIOs over the years, for a very, very simple example, um, agile development does not line up with annual budget and finance. How are you with Informatica helping to acculturate executive teams to think through uh, new processes, new approaches to doing these things so that the business is better able to use the data so that consequential action happens as a concept with these great insights that we're generating. Yeah, yeah so that the whole change management effort is a, a huge and complex uh, thing to overcome, but I have, a, I have a personal passion about making sure that you always remind people why they're doing it. Too often as product people or technologists, we get into the, the how and the what, and we forget the why, and as soon as it gets difficult, people abandon because it starts, it starts to get too hard, it starts to get painful, and if they've lost sight of the big why, they're not going to roll their sleeves up and gut it out and get through, the, get through the process. So that's the first thing you have to do is remind them that the prize at the end is worth the pain and it will be, it will be painful because no longer are you optimizing just your function. You have to think about what happens upstream from you, what happens downstream from you, and trying to optimize things at the enterprise level. And that's not the way most people were brought up. It's not how they're measured. It's not how they are compensated. But that's what's really required if you're yeah. going to if you're going to make that that transformation, and think but end to end. But it's also it's also and, and even our language. We talk about innovation in this industry as though it was synonymous with just creating something new. Uh, certainly, our research very strongly shows that there's a difference between inventing something, which is an engineering act, and innovating around something, which is a social act. Exactly what you just said. How do we get people to adopt things and change behaviors and fully utilize something and embed it within their practices so that we get derivative mm. innovation and all the other stuff that we're looking for? Yeah, there's no easy recipe. People are different, so people require a different story in order to have them buy in. Some people are loss frame people, where you got to explain, here's, what, here's what's going to be bad if you don't do this. Yeah. Other people are gain frame people where you can say, you know, if we can accomplish this, we'll be able to do these great things. And it would be great if everyone was the same and one story worked for everyone, but it doesn't. So it's, yeah. it's almost a, a feet on the street, go talk to people and just keep reminding everyone why you're doing this and why it's going to be worth it. A little bit of behavioral economics there. Graham, I want to ask you one final question. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned client server and how it was easy on-prem in the old days to get your arms around things, uh, which is the IT practice, you know, that was the way it was done. Yeah. And to cloud, a little bit more complex. But to take that a little step further, I want to get your thoughts on something. You live through the world of server sprawl. More servers, more glue, yeah, you get your arms around it, but then it got bloated, IT got bloated, and that's one of the catalysts for going to the cloud is efficiencies, bottom line costs, but now top line revenue now is a mandate. So now we have SaaS sprawl. Yep. So <clears throat> with APIs, a little more security concern, but your thoughts on the, now we have a SaaSification happening, or API economy, so you have a lot more APIs, there's microservices coming on the scene, it's emerging very quickly, still emergent, yeah. embryonic if you will, some will say not so, but I think it's embryonic still, but okay, server, spr server sprawl, client server, VM sprawl, <laughs> now you got SaaS sprawl, your thoughts on this dynamic and, and how a CIO tackles that? Mm. Yeah, so it's, um, 
it's the modern equivalent of your legacy technical debt. So it's a modern mess instead of a, a, an old mess, it's but it's the same problem. Uh, you know, you have to stitch these applications together and it's made, it's made worse by the ease of consuming these SaaS applications. So one business function can go off and buy an application that's just for them. And then the adjacent business function goes off and buys another application that's just for them. And before, uh, before you know where you are, your uh, single sign-on page has three pages because you've got so many applications that you're using yeah. to run your business. So I think we have to be more thoughtful and think, uh, you know, m not make the same mistake that we made after 2000 when we went nuts on all these client-server applications and make sure that we're thinking about the end-to-end -end business outcome. So the unification and layer is what? Identity? Is it the data? I mean, how do you think about that it's just conceptually? Well, I think you, you still need a sensible portfolio of applications. I don't advocate that you just go buy every great application that's out there. If your business doesn't compete based on the capability that that uh, application provides, you're going to no business innovate and just be as good as the next right. guy. But if you compete based on something, go pick the very best application you can, but deploy it thoughtfully, make sure it's integrated yeah. and make sure it serves the end to end. Well, well, point I'm also fascinated by the role that Claire might play here at, at going and looking at the metadata associated with some of these SaaS applications yeah. to help us identify patterns yeah. and utilization. I, I think Claire and the, the thing that was announced here actually could have an impact on the, thinking about some of these the things. The Clairvoyant app is a great one. Claire, I mean, she, he, I mean, it's, it's <laughs> vendor neutral, that's a whole different story. Only kidding. Final thought, Graham, on um, this show. Just color, perspective, what's your thoughts so far Just on the show yeah. vibe for the folks who aren't here, what's it like? Yeah, so when you and I met a couple of weeks ago, I, we talked about the fact that I just joined the company just after last year's show. So I have nothing to compare it to, but the energy level is, is phenomenal. The feedback from the customers I've talked to just reinforces that we have really, really important customers and we are really important to them. You know, the customers are the ones driving this digital transformation and we're proud to be helping them. And every conversation I've had with customers has really reinforced that and yeah. it's great. Can't yeah. wait to get back yeah, to as the As we say, then the KPI, the metric of the <laughs> this transformation world is not you know, quadrants or category winners, it's customer wins. Absolutely. And I think that's a great point. Graham Thompson, uh, Executive Vice President uh, and Chief Information Officer at Informatica, sharing his insight. He is integral part of their transformation as well as his customers Informatica world coverage with theCUBE. Continues, I'm John Furrier with Peter Burris with Wikibon.com. We'll be back with more. Stay with us after this short break.